thirsty, come to the well that never runs dry. Drink of the water, come and thirst no more. Come all you sinners, come find his mercy. Come to the table, he will satisfy. Taste of his goodness, find what you're looking for. For God so loved the world that he gave us, his one and only Son to save us. Whoever believes in him will live forever. And as we were singing these words, I was thinking that I do not want us as God's people to miss the fact that he so loved the world, but he so loved me and he so loved you. And this morning, you may be heavy hearted. You may have come and carrying burdens, but he says to come all you weary and I will give you rest. So we're going to sing this again this morning. And I encourage you just to sing this out and just praise the Lord. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Drink of the water, come and thirst no more. Come all you sinners, come find his mercy. Come to the table, he will satisfy. Taste of his goodness, find what you're looking for. See 
from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, praise Him for the wonders of His love. Welcome to the Church of Chapel Hill. We're so glad you're here. I have several announcements, but um, Pastor John made fun of me the other day and said that uh, I'm not one to tickle ears when I get up here, so I might as well live up to my reputation. I really like that song, and it says, whoever believes in him will live forever. I got news for you. You're going to live forever, whether you believe in him or not. It's just where you're going to end up that matters. So I really like the song. But if you don't believe in him, you're still going to live forever. You're just not going to like it very well. So just wanted to point that out to you. Several announcements now that I've killed the mood. Um, let's start with our memory verse. New memory verse for the month. Um, we'll read this together. We're in Psalm 18, verses 28 through 30. Here we go. You will light my lamp. The Lord my God will enlighten my darkness. For by you I can run against a troop. By my God I can leap over a wall. As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is proven. He is a shield to all who trust in him. Amen. Eternally a shield to all who trust in him. Next verse, Regs. Don't forget to sign up for the Remind app. Again, we've talked about this several times. If you haven't already done so, please do that. You put the number like you would, where you would put a phone number if you were texting someone, and then you put the at, church at Chapel Hill, Mount Vernon, the C-A-C-H-M-V, as the message that you would be sending to someone if you were texting back and forth. Next screen. Don't forget that not only is October 10th our anniversary service, 26 years, but it is also a baptismal celebration. So if you have never been biblically baptized, or you were baptized and you don't remember it because you were so young, or you feel like you really got saved afterwards, speak to Pastor John. What an important step to take of obedience. The Bible tells us that we are supposed to be biblically baptized, immersed in water, and it's a step of obedience, and this is something that you need to do. You know, many of us have social media and stuff, this is what you're supposed to be proclaiming. This is what you should be putting on your social media. And if you've decided to follow Jesus, you should be shouting that from the rooftops and posting pictures that you've been biblically baptized. Continuing, Sunday, and I try to put these in chronological order, but I apologize, they won't be today because they just kept coming. I'm going to go fast now, I promise. Sunday, October 24th at 4 p.m., the 50-plus group is having an ice cream and movie night. You can sign up at the Connection Center if you are interested. So again, that's October 24th, coming up this month. On Monday, October 25th at 6.30, the Women's Bible Study begins. And if interested, you can see Kim White, who's sitting over here, um, for the Women's Bible Study. The Fusion Group is reigniting, so to speak, and that will begin Sunday evening, next Sunday evening at 6.30 p.m. in the balcony. 
For those of you who weren't here at that time, Fusion is, is a mix of faith and family, kind of people with young kids, 18 and 20 and younger. That group of family members, or I'm sorry, that group of people gets together and kind of serves as its own small group. Again, we will be meeting in the balcony starting next Sunday. There is also a calendar of future events, I'm told, somewhere in here today, maybe on a back table. So if you are a part of the Fusion group, please grab that calendar. Yes, the announcements keep going. I'm sorry. Thursday is Bring Your Bible to School Day, kids. So whether you're at a public school or you're at this school where you bring your Bible every day, don't forget to take your Bible to school on Thursday. If you want more information about that, you can simply Google Bring Your Bible to School Day. Lots of information will pop up. There's more. Trunk or Treat is coming up October 27th. So mark your calendars, Wednesday, October 27th. Kristen likes it so much, she scheduled it for her birthday. So be here. Um, adults that participate, start looking for those candy sales because we want to make sure our kids are loaded down with candy and then we send them home. That's our plan. So keep that in mind. And lastly, this one's way in the future, but December 10th will be the Christmas banquet for the church. So if you're a person who likes to put things on your calendar, you can do that now. I'm out of breath. Thankfully, I'm out of announcements. So let's pray for the service. Father, I'm looking down at this paper and I see Pastor John is going to be preaching a message today titled, I've Been Changed. Lord, thank you for being willing to change wicked sinners like me. Father, I am so grateful that you sent your son to die a horrible death for someone as horrible as me. I pray that hearts would be touched, Lord, and if, that, if someone is here that hasn't been changed by the gospel, that they would open their heart and be willing to listen. Because as I said earlier, you will live forever. We are eternal beings. The key is where we are going to live, with you in paradise or separated from you in a place called hell, Lord. And we don't want anyone to end up there. So, Father, may hearts be open to be changed. And those of us who know you, may our hearts be open so that we continue to grow in you and be sanctified and walk closer to you, Lord. Father, I pray that you would bless the offering your people continue to give, Lord, whether it's dropping in the plates, setting to my right, their left, or giving online. Bless it, multiply it, so that we can use it to bring glory to your name. And Father, we ask all of these things in the holy, righteous name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
our children ages 4 to 12 to kids church ages 3 and under are dismissed to the nursery and as they go out let's just continue to sing this you said it I believe it you said it it is done this morning he has the power to turn your life upside down and completely transform you all you have to do is surrender and say Lord you said it I believe it therefore it is done let's sing this out I invite you to take your copy of God's Word and turn to the book of Acts, chapter 8. That is the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. While you're turning there, let me say thank you to Pastor Dan for preaching last Sunday. It was such a blessing as he preached and focused on having a perfect heart towards the Lord. 
and I was blessed by his message and we took up a love offering during that service and you know when you consider where we are in our world the times we're in and uh, we ask you all to give generously and I had a number in my mind that I was hoping that we would get to um, wanted to be generous but also just you know realistic and uh, Donna told me this morning that uh, after she counted it up, our church family gave five thousand six hundred and sixty-five dollars for the Taylors. So that that is tremendous, and I just couldn't be more grateful, humbled, and thankful for your generosity and for your obedience to the Lord, uh, just to give what he laid on your heart and uh, so looking forward to sharing <clears throat> that with the Taylors soon and um, just just want to say thank you so much really really uh, blown away just by your by your graciousness and your kindness well as we prepare for our baptism service and our anniversary service next Sunday and again if you haven't signed up sign up maybe after today you'll want to a little bit more uh, but uh, it's going to be tremendous. So excited about it. But I want to share with you a story about baptism, one of the first baptisms that we find in Scripture after the commencement of the church. And it's a phenomenal story. And so I want to preach for this Sunday, Lord willing, and next on this thought, I've been changed. I've been changed. And before we get into this story, I want to give you a little historical background on baptism, why we do it, what it means, and the significance of it. And um, historically, baptism has been used as a rite of initiation, a rite as an R-I-T-E, showing the inductee's entrance into a new belief or observance. Baptism in the church is also a picture and a token of the forgiveness of sins we experience as salvation. And most Bible scholars believe there are seven, seven different baptisms, main baptisms found in Scripture. And I want to just take a few minutes and show them to you um, on the screens. The first baptism we read of in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 3, it is the baptism of Moses. And the Israelites were delivered from slavery in Egypt and were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They were identified with Moses' deliverance by passing through the Red Sea and following God's presence in the cloud. So that was one type of baptism. Second baptism is the baptism of John. We read of that in Mark chapter 1, verse 4. John the Baptist preached repentance of sins in preparation for the coming of the Messiah, baptizing people in the Jordan River. Those who were baptized by John were showing their faith in John's message about Jesus and their need to confess their sin. Thirdly is the baptism of Jesus. Matthew chapter 3 verses 13 through 17 gives this account. And this was Jesus' act of identifying with sinful humanity even though he was sinless deity. He came and put himself in our shoes. And although Jesus did not need to repent of sin, he came to John to be baptized to be an example for us to follow in his steps. The fourth baptism is the baptism of fire found in Matthew chapter 3 verses 11 through 12. John the Baptist prophesied that Jesus would baptize men with fire. This speaks of Jesus judging the world for its sin. Those who are judged by Christ in the last day will be cast into the lake of fire according to Revelation chapter 20 verse 15. Fifthly is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Find that in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 Verse 13 in Ephesians 1, verses 13 through 14. John the Baptist also predicted that Jesus would baptize men with the Holy Spirit. This is a spiritual baptism, and it is a baptism that saves us. At salvation, we are immersed in the Holy Spirit. The Spirit covers us, indwells us, fills us, and makes us part of the spiritual body of Christ. The baptism of the Spirit is what initiates us into new life in Christ. The first people to experience the baptism of the, of the Spirit were the believers in Acts 2 on the day of Pentecost. 
The spiritual entity known as the body of Christ is formed by this baptism. Number six is the baptism of the cross. Mark chapter 10, verses 35 through 39 says Jesus used the language of baptism to refer to his sufferings and those of his disciples. The baptism Jesus speaks of here is the suffering he was to endure. The disciples would suffer as well. And then seventh is the baptism of believers. That's, Lord willing, what we will do next Sunday, found in Matthew 28, verse 19. This is the washing in water to symbolize the action of the Holy Spirit in a believer's heart. Believer's baptism is one of the two ordinances given to the church. All who follow Christ should be baptized since it is commanded by our Lord. Water baptism is a picture of us being buried with Christ and rising to newness of life. Our sins are washed away and we are cleansed. It is spirit baptism that saves us, but water baptism is our outward expression of that event. Romans chapter 6 verses 3 and 4 says, All of us who were baptized in Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. We were therefore buried with him and through his baptism through baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. So I know that was a lot to take in just for a couple of moments, but those are the pictures of baptism. And of the seven baptisms found in Scripture, only two that we teach here are of personal significance to the Christian today. That is the baptism of the Holy Spirit that saves us, and believer's baptism, believer's water baptism that identifies us with the church and with Christ. The other baptisms that we mention were unique baptisms for other times limited to certain people or still for future events. So with that, I want to, again, just remind you that there are two main ordinances that we practice in the church. That is the Lord's Supper, communion, and then believer's baptism, and both of those are significant biblical acts of worship and obedience that we practice here at Chapel Hill. So with that as kind of a setting for speaking on baptism, I'd like for you to take God's Word, stand, and let's give reverence and honor to the reading of God's Word. Acts chapter 8, verse 25. The disciples are continuing after the beginning of the church, and they are out spreading the gospel. And in verse 25 it says, So when they had testified, speaking of the disciples, they're out ministering for the Lord. When they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem preaching the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. Now an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise, and go toward the south along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is desert. So he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia a eunuch of great authority under Candace, the queen of, Ethiop of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasury, and had come to Jerusalem to worship, was returning. And sitting in his chariot, he was reading Isaiah the prophet. Then the spirit said to Philip, Go near and overtake this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, Do you understand? what you are reading. And he said, how can I unless someone guides me? Before I pray, let me just say this. I sense in my heart and in my, my mind that the Lord wants to do a great work in some people's lives today in this building. I truly believe that. I have been praying specifically for some of you over the past couple of weeks and you are here and I just want to tell you that God loves you and he wants to do a tremendous mighty work in your life today. So my encouragement to you is whatever the Lord uh, stirs in your heart. Just obey it. Obey it. Let's pray. Father, we are grateful for your word. 
And I pray that this exciting story of a man whose life is turned upside down would so move and so grip and so ignite the hearts of your people and ignite and set on fire the hearts of those, Lord, who are here, who are, who are spiritually lost, who are wondering, who are searching, who are hurting. And Lord, I pray today, God, that we would see life change in this place. And that someone or someones can walk out of here today and say, I have been changed by Jesus Christ. And Lord, the Apostle Paul said, I didn't come with excellent speaking. I didn't come with a polished delivery. I came in fear, trembling, but I came in the power of the Holy Spirit to just preach the good news. And Lord, I pray today for those sitting here in this sanctuary, maybe some watching online, that, Lord, as they hear your word, that you, Holy Spirit, would so move in their heart that they would no longer resist, but that they would say yes to Jesus today. You said today, today is the day of salvation, and I pray that it would be so. In Jesus' name, amen. Please, please be seated. I want you to look at verse. We got a lot of uh, ground to cover. Lord willing, we'll take this story in two parts. But I want you to see a picture of obedience. Look at verses 26 and 27 in Acts chapter 8. It says, Now the angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is desert. This is desert. So he arose and went. He arose and went. That's obedience. The Lord said, Philip, go. And he got up and went. He didn't know what he was going to encounter. He didn't know when he was going to need to stop. He didn't know who he was going to need to talk to. But God said, look, you get up and you go. And God has some of you sitting here today, and he's saying to you, hey, you need to go. You need to go. The Great Commission is Mark chapter 16, verse 15, that says, go, go. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. You say, well, I can't go to China right now. No, that, that contextually that is saying you go to all the world. This is part of the world. You go where you are. Now, God may send you or God may send someone else to further places away. But the commandment here for the Great Commission is here. In this community, where you live, where you dwell, in your context, you go to the people in your vicinity and you give them the good news. You give them the gospel. And so we see that Philip obeys the Lord to go. He didn't have all the details, but by faith he went. Philip was, we just read in verse 25, it says, uh, look what it says there. It says, when they were preaching in the gospel in many villages. Now these disciples, they had a crowd. They had people, everybody likes a big crowd. I was able to go to the Bengals uh, game this past Thursday. And man, they've been bad for so many years. And I was just, I was blown away when I went in there. And, uh, and the mass of people, because the Bengals have started winning a little bit. And uh, man, the, it, people were just so fired up and excited and, and the music, and the football players, and, and the flags, and the fireworks, and it was just incredible. Everybody loves a crowd, and uh, they like all that comes with that. And yet the Lord comes to Philip, and he says, I want you to, I want you to remove yourself from the crowd, and I want you to head 
to the desert, and it says south. So this is speaking of, this is around noontime. This is a pretty much, a, by and large, a deserted area. It's in the heat of the day, so very few travelers traveled during that time. And so it's an uh, uh, illogical location, and it's an inopportune time. Perfect recipe for God to work. Because God in His sovereignty is working behind the scenes in the hot places. He's working behind the scenes in the uncomfortable regions. He's working in the dry places where there doesn't seem to be anything going on. And Philip removed himself and obeyed the Lord and he went pursuing after one soul. And he didn't even know who they were. And isn't that like Jesus in Matthew chapter 18, verse 12? Jesus said, if a shepherd has a hundred sheep and one strays on the mountain, does Jesus, does the shepherd not leave the ninety and nine and go and find that one lost sheep? And the answer is yes, he does. And that's what Philip is doing here. He is out looking for one sheep. You know, it's dry right now. Uh, we are in a a desert experience in our world and our nation with all that's going on. It's just a dry time. You feel like the resources are drying up. You feel like relationships are drying up. You feel like uh, authority and, and our government is just, dry, just sucking it all up. Things are drying out. And it's a, it's a, it's a time of just, you just feel like there's full-on heat just coming at us, just like Philip is experiencing in this desert. But I want to tell you today that if you are sitting in this place, God has you here for a purpose. From the beginning of time, the sovereign God of creation has been, has been putting together the ske your schedule, putting together the dates, putting together your years, your months, your weeks, your days, your minutes, for you to be here today. Believe it. Believe it. God had me birthed in 1980 on June 13th, on June Friday the 13th, 1980, and He ordained for me to be on this platform at 1044 in the morning preaching to you. That's God's plan from the beginning of time. It's not an accident. You're not here by chance. I, God hadn't called me to preach uh, just by chance. He has a sovereign plan and He is looking for you. He is pursuing us. And you are here to encounter God. So we see obedience and then we see God, lo God loves us. And is in pursuit of lost souls. Look at verse 27. It says, So he arose and went, and behold, a, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority, under Candace the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasury, and had come to Jerusalem to worship, was returning, and sitting in his chariot, he was reading Isaiah the prophet. This guy was a man of great authority, the Bible says, an influence. Uh, he was trusted. He would have been to our United States, he would have been the Minister of Finance or the Secretary of the Treasury. I mean, he was up there at the top. The high up echelon. And yet this rich man, this blessed man, this, this impressive man was totally lost. He was lost. And yet God is pursuing him on a desert road. This Ethiopian eunuch traveled 200 miles. 200 miles. Because he was hungry for something that all the money and prestige and honor he had accumulated in Ethiopia could not satisfy. That's a long trip with donkeys and horses and riding and the back of a chariot. And that's some that are hearing me today. God has blessed you. God has allowed you to have health. He's allowed you to have a measure of wealth. He's allowed you to have friends. He's allowed some of you to have 
family, children. God's blessed you. But it doesn't satisfy without Jesus. And for some of you, there is a gnawing, there is a low rumble, a low growling grumble in your soul that says this is not enough. Something is missing. Something is missing. And I want to tell you today that only Jesus, only Jesus Christ can satisfy that emptiness in your heart. Amen? Only Jesus can satisfy. John chapter 6 verse 44 says, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And the Lord is drawing some of you today. Say, it is time. It is time to come to Jesus and be saved. No matter your status, no matter your skin color, no matter your background, no matter your nationality, no matter where you work, no matter, no matter what you do, God is pursuing you. No matter your age, see, older people, young people, all throughout this sanctuary, God is in pursuit of you today. You, personally, you. He's, he's, he's looking for you. And he wants to change your life. And then look at verse 28. God loves us. He's pursuing us. And he calls his church to get people while they're hungry. Look at verse 28. It says, This man was returning and sitting in his chariot. He was reading Isaiah the prophet. There are three essential elements, by and large, that lead and bring someone to salvation who are lost. That is the Holy Spirit, the Word of God, and the man of God. The Holy Spirit draws them. The Word of God is open to them. And then the man of God preaches it and gives the gospel, the good news. And we see all three at work in this story. And here is a lost man. He went to Jerusalem. Didn't find what he was looking for, but he obviously must have put, picked up a scroll of Isaiah. And he's heading back that 200 mile trip as he's heading back home he's sitting in his chariot and this isn't one of the chariots that you would think of like you know in Ben-Hur with Charlton Heston where, where he's up there just you know thrashing the horses and it's just this little you know this little personal uh, uh, cubicle cart that he's riding and no he was a prestigious he would have had a, a, a convoy with him pretty much and there would have been many servants with him and this is a chariot where he would have been sitting in the back with like a canopy over top, and it would have been luxurious. It would have been like, you know, we're driving around the Pintos, and this was, you know, the Cadillac. And uh, he's back there, and he has a chauffeur is driving Miss Daisy, and, and, and he's, he's just going along for the ride. But while he's riding along, he is reading God's Word. And it's incredible how God is drawing him pulling them in. And so, get them while they're hungry. If you've got someone in your life that is, that is, it seems they're hungry, capitalize on that. Engage them. Engage them. Look at verses 29 through 31. It says, he was reading uh, Isaiah the prophet, then the Spirit said to Philip, go near and overtake the chariot. So Philip ran to him. And heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, Do you understand what you are reading? This is engagement. And he said, How can I unless someone guides me? And he asked Philip to come up and sit with him. Questions are effective when sharing the gospel. Do you ever get intimidated to share the gospel? And to share your faith, it is intimidating at times. But this is a great way when the Lord orchestrates the setting and a conversation. And he just, he gives Philip an open door here because this guy's already being primed 
and reading God's word. And so he just asks them a question. That is a great, great opportunity for you is just start talking to someone and instead of saying, hey, you know what, if you die tonight, you're going straight to hell. Now, that may be true, but that's not, I don't believe, the best approach. Um, it's like Pastor Dan was talking about going to the game and people, you know, I mean, get a full view of Scripture and of witnessing. I mean, if the, if the airplane is going down, you don't have time to, to, you know, dance around the bush. But when you're in a relationship with somebody, a neighbor, a spouse, a, a wayward child, you've got to look for opportunity. But use wisdom, and God gives you opportunities. And one, one way to do that is to just ask somebody a question. And then it's for them to answer. How about this question? You know, I've been, I've been spending quite a bit of time with you. You've heard my testimony. You know I'm a Christ follower. Let me ask you, do you know that Jesus loves you? Do you know that Jesus died on the cross for your sins? Do you have peace? Do you, do you know that God is actually has a plan for you? Do you want to know how you can come to faith in Christ? And that's what Philip does here. Look what it says. It says, he ran up to him and he says, Excuse me, sir, I heard you reading the Bible. Do you understand what that means? And you think about the humility of this man already, that here was an authoritative figure, treasury of the secretary. How easy would it have been for him to go, who do, who do you think you are coming up here, invading my private space, asking me if I know what, of course I know what I'm reading. And yet this guy says, I don't. Would, would you be willing to just come up here and just hang out with me? I mean, could you imagine the secretary of the treasury and you're running along and you see him in D.C. riding in, in, a, in an envoy with the presidential uh, secret service and all of a sudden you hear him reading something, you ask him a question, he's like, hey, just hop right in here on the Cadillac with me. Just come on in. That's what the Lord orchestrated on this dry, hot desert road. It's phenomenal. And if you will be praying for God to prime the hearts of those in your life who need Jesus, He will work out opportunities for you to have these same experiences. And so He says, I don't understand. Come up and please share with me. And then I want you to look at verses 32 and 33. It says, the place in the scripture which this Ethiopian was reading was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his justice was taken away, and who would declare his generation for his life is taken from the earth? I want to read to you an excerpt from John Phillips on this passage on the suffering silent servant of whom Isaiah 53 is talking about. It says, the text tells of the Messiah silent before his shearers. We see Jesus abused by the Sanhedrin, ridiculed by Herod, scourged by Pilate, scoffed at by the soldiers. We see him stripped, seemingly as helpless in their hands as a sheep in the hand of its shearer. All the dignity that comes from dress was stripped away. But his silence clothed him with a dignity no insult or injury of man could ever take away. How Philip must have seized upon the silence of Jesus. Yonder in the glory were twelve legions of angels, straining over the battlements of heaven with drawn swords, waiting for a word. One word, and they would have flashed down the, sky, the skyways of the stars, burst upon our planet, stamped flat the high hills of Judea, turned to blood the waters of the seven seas, and ushered in Armageddon then and there. But that word never came. Jesus was silent before his shearers. I want to ask you a question. Why did Jesus not profess his innocence? And he obviously was. It's because if Jesus opened his mouth, 
and said that he was innocent, and he obviously was, that would immediately have condemned you and me. It would have condemned all of humanity because Jesus took our sin and the sin of the whole world, the Bible says, was laid upon him. And he took our place and put us in his place and we traded places. And so Jesus, this Ethiopian is reading that there's this Savior, this Messiah who didn't say a word even though he was being unjustly condemned and he's trying to wrap his mind around that. And Philip said, that's the gospel. That is that Jesus Christ, sir, took your place, kept his mouth shut so you could open your mouth and say that Jesus saves, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. He still does. Amen? That's the gospel. The scripture here has life-giving power. The megaphone of Jesus' silence blasted from that chariot that this man could be saved because the suffering servant, the Lamb of God, was silent. And then, seventh is Jesus is the message we preach. Look at verses 34 and 35. So the eunuch answered Philip, and said, I ask you, of whom does this prophet say this? Of himself or of some other man? Is Isaiah speaking of himself or is he talking about somebody else? Then Philip opened his mouth and beginning at this scripture, preached Jesus to him. Philip didn't preach his own opinions. Philip didn't wow him with his personality. That's one of the most powerful verses in all the Bible. Philip preached Jesus preached Jesus. If you want to win your friends and your family members and your co-workers to Christ, it will be by you preaching Jesus to them. It will be by you giving them Jesus, not just your kindness, not just your generosity. There's going to have to come a time when you let Jesus out of your mouth, out of your heart. Yes, build a bridge. Yes, be kind. Yes, don't confront them uh, constantly about their sin. They're lost. But there's going to have to come a time when you preach Jesus to that person. And God will give you the boldness and the courage if you will obey. Philip was a deacon in the church. And he was an evangelizer. He was a reaper of souls. And the influence that he had on people to come to Jesus again, was not because of who he was, but because of the one who he knew. And that was Jesus Christ. And maybe he, when this man said, Sir, if you just put this in modern times, Sir, what, what does this mean? He could have said this. This is going to fire Shirley up. Mr. Secretary, this is, this is, this is what you're reading. This is what it means. I heard an old, old story. How a Savior came from glory. How he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. I heard about his groaning, of his precious blood's atoning. And sir, I repented of my sins and won the victory. Oh, sir, there is victory in Jesus my Savior forever. He sought me. He pursued me. He sought me and He bought me with His redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew Him. And all my love is to Him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. Have you experienced that today? Do you know? Can you sing when our choir sings? Oh no. Oh no. The old story will never grow old. Do you know the story for yourself? What about you? I sat with a person not long ago and I said, I look at you as someone 
that there's a great dam built in your life. Back here, there is a, just a flood, just floods and floods and floods of God's blessing and God's peace and God's favor and God's help and God's strength and God's healing. And it's just sitting here. And, and, it's, and, and I see in you that there's some little holes in the dam. And, and every once in a while there'll be a little spurt here of some joy. And over here there'll be a little spurts of, 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 of a spiritual experience. And, and over here maybe there'll be a couple little steps of, a, of, a, of stepping towards Christ. But I said, by and large, your life is just so blocked up. You're, 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 you're tense. You're, 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 you're just you're struggling. And, 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 and what is this? What is this? It's this dam that's hindering you. And I want you to look in this scripture in verse 36. After Philip preached Jesus to him, it says, Now as they went down the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What hinders me? What hinders me? What is keeping me held back? What hinders me from being baptized? Then Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. There's this great dam that is built up in some people's lives. And, and back here again is God's salvation, God's forgiveness, God's mercy, and it just wants to break forth in your life. It just wants to spring forth. It's been building and building. For some of you, it's been building for years. This water of God's love and God's mercy. And it's just pushing, pushing against your heart. Pressing down on your mind. And you want to give in, but you say, something is hindering me. Something is keeping God held back in my life. What keeps me from getting baptized, this man said, and identifying that I've been saved. And it was unbelief. It was unbelief. And Philip said, Sir, if you will believe with not a little bit of your heart, and that's some of your struggle right now. Some of you want to believe a little bit. Some of you believe some. Some of you are starting to believe a lot. But the Bible says that when Christ comes on the scene, it is all or nothing. And the Bible says here, Philip said, Sir, if you believe with all your heart, you can get down in the water. But you have to be all in. You must be all in. All to Jesus, I surrender. You cannot ride the fence, folks. You can't do it. It doesn't work. The Bible says that if you are lukewarm, I'll have a little bit of Jesus over here, but I'll have a side dish of the devil over here. I'll have a little bit of the Bible over here, but I'm going to have a little bit of the, the way of the world over here. The Bible says, no, you sell out. You, you give your all to Christ. And when you do, there will be a splitting and a cracking of that wall that sin and pride and resistance has been hindering you from coming to Jesus. And the Bible says that when Jesus died on the cross, that that wall, that veil that separated man from the Holy of Holies was broke open. And my, my appeal to you today, as we get ready to have baptism next Sunday, is that... Maybe one of you still need to sign up, but you know you can't yet because you don't know what the first step is. Some of you know what the first step is. You've known for a long time. What's hindering you? Unbelief? I just don't know if I can really believe that. It may be your past sins. I don't really know that God can... Man, I'm a mess. Fear? I just don't know what my life will look like. I mean, what am I going to have to give up? Who am I going to have to give up? What am I going to have to let go? And the enemy would just keep building that wall thicker and thicker and thicker. But I want to tell you that God 
God is able to break through any sin. He's, over to, he's able to overcome your past. He's able, to, he's able to melt down the resistance that you've built up in your heart year after year, experience after experience of saying no, no, no. And today you are here by sovereign appointment to say yes, yes, yes to Jesus Christ. And God is drawing you to himself saying, come to me. Matthew chapter 11 verse 28 says, come to me. Jesus opens his arms open. There's, there's no stipulations. There's no conditions. You just come. Come to me. All you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I'll give you rest for your soul. For the first time in your life, you can know joy. And you can laugh without having, just continually keeping in that shell. You can know peace. You can know hope. That even with our world falling apart, that there is hope and there is joy in Jesus. This man said, look, I am lost. What is hindering me from getting down in that water? And he said, oh, if you're going to get down in that water, you first got to be all in on Jesus Christ. So I ask you, Lindsay, you come, please. Sin, the sin of pride, uh, is a uh, it can be an an a deceitful sin because we think I don't I don't really need to be saved I mean I'm a good person I do a lot of good things and I used to do quite a bit of bad now I don't I'm, that's pride humility is coming and saying Jesus I surrender all I don't I don't fully understand it do you, do you fully understand electricity? I don't. I believe in it. Because I see the evidence of it. And some of you say, well, you know, if I, if I get all these, these things answered, exactly all my questions answered, the Bible says we come to Christ by faith because we see the evidence of the life change in people all around us. We have the evidence of God's Word. We have the evidence of the Holy Spirit stirring our hearts. Don't allow pride to hinder you from saying yes to Jesus. God, God says that He enlightens people and opens people's spiritual eyes when they come to know Him and trust Him and believe in Him. And so even if you say, well, I'm just a bit apprehensive because all my questions aren't answered. I've been saved for 36 years. And I still don't have all the answers. But I tell you what, I've got enough of the evidence of God working and moving in my life. I had enough evidence in me that I was a young lost sinner that needed to be saved and how Christ has redeemed and turned my life around. Oh, I believe. I believe. And so can you. So can you. And so today, we're going to have a, an invitation that says, are you hurting? Are, are, you, are you wondering? Are you lost? Come to Jesus. Just come to the altar. And if you need to come today, come. Pray with you. See me after the service. But don't let this day pass without saying, you know what? I've run out of options. My options. It's time to give Jesus his due. All right? Would you stand? I'm going to have a word of prayer. And we're going to sing together. Father, we thank you. We thank you for... This simple story about a man that took a long trip 
to Jerusalem. He found when he got there that what he was looking for, man couldn't give him. Religion couldn't give him. He left after he had gone there to worship and to find some help spiritually. He left lost, and yet he left with the Word of God. And you begin to prime his heart for truth. You begin to prepare his heart for Jesus Christ. And then you sent a man along to help enlighten him to what your word means. Lord, no doubt there's people sitting in this building, in this sanctuary, watching online. who You've been priming and prepping the same way. Lord, for them to say yes to Jesus. They've tried being religious. They've tried doing good. None of it's working. I pray today that they would come and just unreservedly say yes to Jesus Christ and be saved. Lord, as we prepare to baptize next Sunday, for there are many getting baptized, and I pray that more would be added to the list and that we can celebrate your love for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's sing together. Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin? Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself?
you're thankful for the redemptive blood of Christ, can we just say hallelujah? hallelujah. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. He still does. I encourage you to encourage one another, bless one another, and uh, invite your family and friends for next Sunday for our anniversary service, our baptism service, and uh, we're going to have the marks here with the kids, and we're going to have the kids out here for the baptism, and we're going to have them back there, so we're going to have lots for the kids to see and experience. Well, we love you guys, and uh, just so grateful to worship with you. Have a blessed day. You're dismissed.